we're trying to do all throughout this semester is, is just get to know each other better, talk about our stories. Uh, for some people, they're going to be talking about the way they became Christians and how they uh, came to fall in love with Jesus. For other people, it's just going to be something that just like a huge moment in their life where they kind of saw God in ways that they never seen him before, where they made a change in a way they never, they never had before. And so all throughout the semester, we're just going to be hearing different stories from people, just like McCall, trying to help us just grow. And uh, hope, hope you get a chance to relate to something that, that, that McCall said today, or you get a chance to really listen and relate, because uh, we all have stories, which is really, really cool, you know? Um, part of our story, right, is where we come from. Was anybody in here uh, not born in the United States? Okay, I want, I want to hear some of these places. Chase, where are you from, brother? I'm from South Africa, everyone. Christ is revealed at his coming. 
as obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all that you do. For it is written, be holy because I am holy. Since you call on a father who judges each work, each, each person's work impartially, live out your time as foreigners here in a reverent fear. Okay, right? So he says, be holy as I am holy. Right? It says, be holy in everything that you do. You know, that word holy is kind of like, we don't really like that word very much, and it sounds, it's just like a really religious sounding word. You know what I'm saying? Like, what do you think of when you think of this word holy? The stuff I think of is like, let's do Jesus, right? That's got like a weird heart thing in the middle of the thing. And it's got like a whole halo thing around his head. You're not totally sure what that is, right? Like, you looks like a, like a white woman, you know, in my life. And so like, if you think of kind of like a religious painting, or you think of like angels and a little baking candle and like stuff like that, you think of like, I don't know, just religion, you know, and the Pope and stuff, or you think of a friar, he's praying, you know, that's the holy God right there, right? I don't know what else to think of, right? Or maybe you've heard the word, who's heard that phrase, like, holier than thou? It's always used in a negative context, right? It's this idea of, like, oh, you think you're so holier than thou, right? Or, I think that's how you would say it, right? <laughs> or, I'm being holier than thou, or something like that, which is basically the idea of you're trying to be all spiritual, and you're kind of like hurting me and judging me if you're a spirituality, right? Like, there's a cool cartoon, right? Here comes the Holy than thou, he's got two halos, so he's, he's men, right? <laughs> and so, this word, this word holy is kind of, it's just, it's just a religious sounding word, right? It's a word that we hear and we're like, okay, I, I, it just doesn't make me feel inspired. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's just not a fun word. And it's, we're going to try to break that down because it's actually a pretty awesome word. And uh, the word actually means this idea of being set apart. It means this idea of being distinct. Totally different. This one I like the best. It talks about set aside for a special purpose. Okay, so the idea of something being holy is something that you set aside for this incredible purpose. Mm. Some of you guys have things that are holy in your life and you don't even know it, right? One of the things that's extremely holy is the bathroom, okay? <laughs> Because why? It's set aside for a really specific purpose. Like, you know, you're not in the, you're not eating dinner in the, on the toilet. You know what I'm saying? Some of you guys are, which is, which is, you're, you're not keeping that thing holy. You know what I'm saying? Like, so some things we have. Or hey, does anybody like take a test? And you take a test only with a certain kind, like this one pen. You know, there's one pen. It's my holy pen, right? Set aside. There's one purpose. It's not used for anything else. You know, for some of you guys, you got like your your holy shirt, you know what I'm saying? Where it's like kind of this, this really nice shirt that you have, you're like, uh-uh, I'm wearing this around anybody else. When I see that girl, I kind of, you know, because I kind of like she's going to be a TNL. Well, I pop on my, my holy shirt, you know what I'm saying? So for me, it's my, it's my basketball shoes, right? Like my basketball shoes for me, it will not touch a grain of asphalt, okay? It is only for the hardwood. Some of you guys know what I'm talking about. You don't use your basketball shoes for anything else besides playing ball. If you see a guy walk around in basketball shoes and you see him playing with him, you know he's not a real hooper, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> so for me, it was kind of this, that's, it's, it's this idea of something that's set aside for a special purpose. And so what are some things, like, what are some things that you guys have maybe that like, are holy to you, like super specific for you? Anybody, anybody have anything? Am I? Um, I have a yellow blanket and that I don't let anyone else yes. sleep with. Yes, exactly, right? You have your special yellow blanket. Nobody else can touch it. This is mine. You know, I love that. Derek? I got my, uh, my go-to outfit. I put it all together. It's not this one. <laughs> <laughs> like, I got a very specific shirt. I like, I know what shorts pair well with it, what socks match well, and like pop the shoes on and bring it all together. Wow. Hold it out. Hold it, right? I love it. Yeah, no, but we all have things in our life that we kind of set aside for a special purpose. And so the Bible talks about this idea of, hey, be holy because, because, I, because I am holy. And so we get a built-in why right there, right? It says be holy not just because for random reasons, but be holy because what? Because I am holy. What do you, like, when, you, when you're describing God, if someone said, hey, just describe God to me. Who is God to you? What are some qualities that you would say about who God is? Anybody want to share? Yeah. Faithful. Faithful. Okay, that's awesome. Um, yeah. Emily. Forgiving. Forgiving? Yeah. Loving. Loving? Totally. All powerful. All powerful. Nice. Yeah. Profound. Mm. Mm. Anybody else? Intentional. Intentional? Yeah, I love it. Owen? Infinite. Infinite. Okay. Uh, 
incomprehensible. All qualities about God, right? It's, like, it's just this, this being that is so like, set apart from who we are. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's this God that like is so much different than you. So much more distinct, yeah. so much more set apart. That's like God is holy. He's like totally other than us, right? He's not even close to who you are. If you think that you and God are kind of similar, then you're probably arrogant. You know what I'm saying? Like you just have no idea. Because God is so much different than who you are. But the goal is that we're trying to become like God. Yeah. Right. I hope somebody kind of, if they said, hey, what, how would you describe Nick? You know, I don't know if you'd say all powerful and stuff like that. But I sure hope you say things like faith. Or you'd say things like forgiving. Or you'd say things like intentional, right? Like, these are qualities about God that we are trying to all become more and more like. There's a story I love that to me shows so much about God's holiness that just blows me away. So go over to Exodus 19, okay? So Exodus chapter 19. Because in order to really understand what it means to like be holy and set apart and used for a special purpose, you really have to understand who God is. Because if you're holy just for the sake of being kind of holy and set apart... You're going to become kind of this religious person that just does a lot of spiritual and kind of religious sounding things. You're not really kind of like really experiencing the power of what it's, of what it's really supposed yeah. to be. And so here in Exodus chapter 19, it's this crazy story that really shows the power of God. Exodus 19, I probably should have turned there, but I started talking. <laughs> turn, there, turn, there, turn, there, turn there first. Okay, Exodus 19. Um, so we'll start in verse, uh, in verse 3. There's this guy Moses, right, that you can read more about him in Exodus 1 through 18. But it says, Then Moses went up to God, and the Lord called to him from the mountain and said, This is what you're to say to the descendants of Jacob, and what you're to say to the people of Israel. You yourselves have seen what I did to Egypt, and how I carried you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Anybody that knows the story of Moses and how he kind of brought the people out of Egypt, it's a crazy story. You know what I'm saying? Like, you got ten plagues, you got water, is this like, like, you know, split in two, and people are walking right through it. You got like staffs that are turned to snakes. You got rivers in the blood. You got swarms of blood, like crazy stuff, right? And guys, like, you guys remember that about me, right? You guys remember how I brought you out of Egypt. Verse 5 says, Now, if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all nations, you will be my treasured possession. Although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests. And a holy nation. These are the words you are to speak to the Israelites. We'll come back to that in a minute. But it gives, us, gives them this incredible promise. Verse 7 says, So Moses went back and summoned the elders of the people and set them before all the words the Lord had commanded him to speak. The people all responded together. We will do everything the Lord has said. So Moses brought their answer back to the Lord. They're like, yeah, we want a part of that, man. Like, we want to be your special possession, God. We saw what you did back in Egypt. Like, you, you're the man, you know? And he's like, we want to be, if you want us to be our, your special possession, we're down. It sounds great to us. And it keeps going. Verse 9, the Lord said to Moses, I'm going to come down to you in a dense cloud so that the people will hear me speaking with you and will always put their trust in you. Then Moses told the Lord what the people had said. So basically, God says to Moses, he's like, okay, the people say that they want to follow me. That's cool. Like, that sound, sounds great. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to come to the people, and I'm going to talk to you. I'm going to come in this dense cloud, and I'm going to talk to you. Which, in that, in that, like, we kind of read the Bible now. Like, oh, that's kind of cool. But, like, imagine that you're an Israelite, kind of everyday person, and then Moses, Moses is kind of saying, hey, I'm going to go talk to that God that we just experienced. That God is about to come down. He's about to talk to us. Right. If you're an Israelite, like, no, no way. No way. Are you serious? Like, that guy, that guy we saw split the water into, he's going to come talk to you? And, like, that's crazy. Right? And, like, God's like, that right there, when they see me talking to you, then they're actually going to believe, and they're going to put all their trust. Because you can't see an event like that, and all of a sudden be like, no, I don't know. I mean, it's not really God. It's like, you know, once you see God talking to a man, that's when you're like, oh, man, this thing is real. So let's see what happens. Verse 10, right? And the Lord said to Moses, go to the people and consecrate them today, which basically means get them ready. Because you can't just be like, oh, God's going to sleep. I'm just sleeping, you know, sleeping, and then I'll wake up and then he's there. It's like, no, no, no. For God to come, you've got to get ready for this. You've got to prepare yourself. You've got to, like, kind of get consecrated, which basically means you've got to, like, purify yourself. You've got to get everything ready because we're about to stand in the presence of God. This is not an ordinary day. This is going to be a crazy day. And he says, have them wash their clothes and be ready by the third day. So it's like, this is going to take three days for you guys to prepare for this. This ain't some ordinary thing. 
say, because on that day, the Lord will come down on Mount Sinai in the sight of all the people, put limits for the people around the mountain, and tell them, be careful that you do not approach the mountain of oh. And then let's go back to verse 12. It says, put limits for the people around the mountain and tell them, be careful that you do not approach the mountain or touch the foot of it. Whoever touches the mountain is to be put to death. They are to be stoned or shot with arrows. Not a hand is to be laid on them. No person or animal shall be permitted to live. Only when the ram's horn sounds a long blast may, be, may you approach the mountain. So God's saying, hey, I'm about to come on this mountain. It's going to be so intense that you're going to have to put limits around the mountain. Because when my power is there on that mountain, if somebody crosses over and touches this mountain, because of how powerful I am, they have, they're, they're gonna die. And they're gonna die, you can't even touch them with your hands. You have to like stone them or shoot them with arrows because if you touch them, you would die, right? It's just this crazy interaction where like, there's many times in the scriptures where a guy like Moses says, hey God, can I see you? And he's like, no, because if you saw me, you would die, right? Or other, other uh, people like, um, Isaiah, right, when he had a vision, and he's standing in the presence of God, and the first thing he says, he's like, oh, I'm dead, like, because you can't come, you can't come into the presence of God, and literally, it says, if you come in his presence and saw him, you wouldn't be able to live. Wow. It's kind of like the idea of the sun, right, where the sun is so powerful, right. it gives us life, it gives us everything, it's so good, it gives us warmth, it gives life and light to everything else around us, but if you go too close to the sun, then you're, then you're toast. You know what I'm saying? You're toast. But it's not because the sun's bad and it's punishing you. It's because the sun is so good. Right. It's so powerful that, like, you can't be around it because it's just too intense. Right. That's what God is saying right here. And basically, watch what happens next. Verse 14, it says, After Moses had gone down the mountain of the people, he consecrated them, washed their clothes. Then he said to the people, Prepare yourselves for the third day and abstain from sexual relations. On the morning of the third day, there was thunder and lightning with a thick cloud over the mountain and a very loud trumpet blast. Everyone in the camp trembled. Then Moses led the people out of the camp to meet with God. And they stood at the foot of the mountain. Mount Sinai was covered with smoke because the Lord descended on it in fire. The smoke billowed up from it like the smoke of a furnace and the whole mountain trembled violently. A mountain trembling violently. That's a crazy thought right there. As the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder, Moses spoke, and the voice of God answered him. You know, this is probably what it looked like. There, there are some cool sound effects, but it's a little bit like lower now because of the thing isn't working. But it's like, look at, look at what you have right here, right? You got like all these people standing at this mountain. Imagine watching that. You'd be like, oh, like that. Okay, that's getting a little bit annoying now. So <laughs> And so imagine, imagine standing at the foot of that mountain, looking up at God, right, where it's this massive cloud of smoke yeah. and lightning all around it, and it looks like there's fire on the mountain. Yeah. And all of a sudden, trumpet blasts are like out of nowhere. You're like, oh my goodness, what is this? You know, and you're standing there, and you're, it says they're trembling. They're coming before God, because it's not like any everyday thing for you to approach the throne and the presence of Almighty God. So they're coming up, and they're like, oh my goodness, they're trembling, they're shaking, they're like, we, we can't talk to this guy. And all of a sudden, Moses just kind of walks up. They're like, Moses, what are you doing, bro? Like, what are you doing? Like, you can't talk to that guy. Right? And he kind of walks up, and he's, and he's kind of standing there. And then all of a sudden, you hear God speaking to Moses. Imagine if you were there in the crowd, would you have ever forgotten that day? You think, like, in your mind right there, you're like, I'm never going to doubt in my life again. Like this, that's, that's God right there. You know, the Bible talks about talks and tells us to have a reverent fear of God. Mm -hmm. You know, some fear is actually really good. Like, I'm afraid. It's good to be afraid of fire. Right. Even though fire is, like, really useful and it's really good for a lot of things, there's a good, healthy, like, like, reverence for fire. Because if you mess with it, and if you don't handle it right, then you're going to get burned, right? You have to have a healthy reverence for your professors. Right? Because <laughs> you can't just be like, you hey, whatever, man, whatever this is like, I'm just not really, I'm not really feeling today. You know, and just don't do whatever. Like, I'm just not gonna take the test. You know what I'm saying? Like you have to have a little bit of a of a healthy fear right. of your of your professors, right? And like fear can be a really good thing. I remember one time my teacher when I was in Japan, his name was Mr. Fear on, right? So I was like, he's from Canada. His name is Mr. Fear on. I remember one time I was getting really confident in myself. I was only I was a really obnoxious 
you know, fourth grade. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> and so I was walking this alongside of him one day, and I'm just kind of walking, I'm like, yo, what's up, man? Kind of we're walking a bit, like, to the park together or something like that, like with the rest of the class behind me. And I kind of left him, we walked up next to him. He's like, he looks down at me and says, he's like, man, get back here. I'm not your buddy. He's like, <laughs> I'm scarred for the rest of my life. I never wanted to speak to him again, you know, and I was scared. But it was like, it's kind of this idea of June. Like, I'm not, I'm not like just this, this buddy you kind of like just think you can, you can hang out with like that, you know what I'm saying? And I think sometimes it's good for us to kind of feel that way yeah. about God. Yeah. Because I feel like we are way too casual yeah. with God. Or we're like, God, you know what, man? You're kind of like that, but I'm, I'm good doing me. I might, I might talk to you for like two minutes right before I go to sleep. Yeah. You know? Or we're coming to God's presence, like, all right, what up, God? Hey, can you give me this, 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 and this? Sweet. All right, I'll catch you later. You know? Because we just have this casual, this casu- casuality, mm-hmm. right, about God. Where he's not that fire and smoke and lightning God that we see about in the scriptures. And we can so easily say, oh, you know, God probably still loves me. I feel like he, like, I have a sincere love for him. I can kind of do what I want. But, you know, God still, kind of still loves me. Right? Like, I got that feeling he does right inside. But if that's like, if that's how you feel, where you're like, you think you know the intentions of God. And you know his heart, you know who he is. And you just think that you can just kind of be around him in a casual way. I think that that's really scary. Yeah. And I think in our generation, in our, in our world today, that God has become kind of non-existent yeah. in our personal lives, in our personal walk every single day. I think what's so amazing about that God right there, right? He's not this big thunderous God that just wants to like say, hey, do this, do this, do this, don't do this. He's like, no, 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 I'm this God that he's looking at you and saying, I want you to be my treasured possession. He's like, I love you so much. I'm setting you apart for this special, incredible purpose. Mm. He's like, you're not just like anything else out there. I made the animals, I made the trees, I made the mountains, but then I made man, and I made woman, mm. and I made them, and I, and I looked at that, and I said, that, oh, that's very good. And I set them apart, and I was like, I can't wait to see what, what they're going to do. I can't wait to have a relationship with them. I can't wait. For, I have so many incredible plans for them, what they're going to do. I, I, I imagine God is getting so excited. He's like, you just got to trust me, though. You just got to hang out with me. That God you see on the mountain, that's who I am. Just remember that. Remember that I'm for you. I'm not against you. And he's kind of walking with us, kind of giving us this confidence and saying, I can't wait to hang out with them because they're amazing. And I set them aside for this very special, mm. this very special purpose. Our lives are meant to be set apart. You know, at the very beginning, God created us in whose image? In his image. What? You mean that the God we see on that mountain, that we are created in his image mm. to look like him, to act like him, to be like him? That's who we're created to be. That was our original purpose. That is one of the most incredible honors of all time. And when God calls us to be holy, when he calls us to be, he said, hey, be holy. Be set apart just as I am set apart. That's actually this call like to greatness. Yeah. He's like, you guys know who I am. I want you to be just mm-hmm. like that. I want you actually to live out what your original purpose in life was. Mm-hmm. And that's what holiness is. Holiness, this idea of being set apart, is actually the idea of becoming who you were originally always meant to be. Yeah. yeah. And for us, when he says be holy, he's like, be that incredible human that I created there. Yeah. Don't listen to the lies. Don't get like, don't conform to the stupid stuff of the world. If they're trying to say, hey, do this, this, and this, you're gonna reject that God that we just saw right there. He's like, no, no, no. I want you to live out this incredible purpose that I have for you. Yeah. And it's gonna be good. You know, holiness has a lot less to do with, like, moral goodness. and has a lot more to do with your relationship with this almighty God. Mm-hmm. And it's about kind of this holiness, this connection with him. But there are some passages that are kind of just, that are interesting to me. You know, right here it says, therefore, 2 Corinthians chapter 7, since we have these promises about being his holy possession and dearly loved and all that kind of stuff, it says, dear friends, let us purify ourselves from everything that contaminates body and spirit, perfecting holiness out of reverence for God. What does that say? He said, I want you to perfect holiness. Not that you're going to be perfect, but that you're kind of buying, you're all in. You're buying into this idea that, like, I was made for a more special and greater purpose than what I see everybody else living around. He's like, I want you to buy into that. But in order to really see that, you've got to, like, you got to purify yourself from everything that contaminates you. You know, what if I 
hand you some water right now. I said, hey, here's some water. It's really hot outside. You know, like you just came in, maybe like a long run or something like that, 95 degree weather we got. I was like, dude, fuck, you know, here, here you go. Here's some water. And, uh, and I was like, here's some water, but, you know, just want to let you know, I like, I like peeing in it a little bit. You know? <laughs> you like, you, <laughs> there'd be no question that you're not drinking that, you're not drinking that water, right? Because it's contaminated, right. you know? It's like contaminated. Even a little bit, right? It's contaminated. It doesn't need to be a lot. To me, that's kind of what I hear in the scripture. It's like, guys, it's not just enough to be kind of a good person. It's not just enough to say, oh, I go to church sometimes. It's the idea of I'm trying to perfect what it means to be fully human. I'm trying to be everything I can be. Everything I do, I'm trying to do it in the way that God wants me to do it, right? You see this next passage, Hebrews 12. It says, make every effort to live in peace with everyone and to be holy. Without holiness, holiness, no one will see the Lord. That's kind of sobering to me. Romans 12. The last passage being basically says, you, you cannot live the way you want to live. Yeah. If you think you can be a Christian and just live any way you want, you're mistaken. Yeah. Right. You cannot be a Christian and not and not become holy the way God is holy. Mm-hmm. It's just it's it's clear in the scriptures we see it right here. Yeah. Romans 12 says, Therefore I already brothers and sisters in view of God's mercy to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. <laughs> this is your true and proper worship. <laughs> not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is. His good, pleasing, and perfect will. He says, hey, do not conform to the pattern of this world. It's like every day you've got to renew your mind. Start thinking the way that God thinks. It's like when you start to become holy, when you start to not conform to the way the world does, you actually start to test and approve and learn about what God's will is for you and what his will is for everybody else. Mm-hmm. So that's really the goal. I don't want to go through life thinking that I got and I know all the answers on how to live life. God has all the answers. He knows what it's all about. But in order to really kind of fulfill his purposes and really get the benefits that he's trying to offer, I got to really do it his way. I got to go and see what does God really want me to do? And for us, we're trying to figure out how do we do that in everything that we do. And so we're going to give a few examples. Ruth's actually going to come and share a little bit about uh, about her
you to be, though? Doesn't the world tell you, like, voice, voice your voice, right? Say it loud, say it proud, don't care what people think of it. But God is like, be careful. These are my words coming out of your mouth now. I want you to think like me. And then, honestly, my, my, he has changed my mind. of like, I, I want to use my words to honor him. I understand now. You know, and even, like, I just, I appreciate so many examples. And I've had to change a lot of this, too. But it changes the way I think, too, of how I present myself to the rest of the world. And, you know, I, and Toya shared this with me, too. And I know a lot of you guys have done this, where literally she started following God, started falling in love with him, wanting to please him, wanting to honor him. She went through her closet, and she literally threw away every item of clothing that was a little bit immodest. And then she went on a Facebook cleanse, and she deleted every picture that showed anything that she didn't want to show to the rest of the world. She was like, you know what? I am the king now. I walk with the king. My life is not my own. It changes the way you think. Does that make sense? Yeah. And so it's not this all these outside things changes. It's like your brain changes. And, right. you know, most obvious way I think that when anyone is set apart, it's so obvious when they're dating. Because holiness change, changes who you choose to date, right, for one. Because you cannot expect to have a holy dating relationship with someone that's not pursuing holiness, right? right. So go ahead and understand that if you want a holy dating relationship, if you want to honor God with your life and with your dating relationship, your dating pool has gotten smaller <laughs> because it is set apart. And I thank God for that. I thank God that he showed me what I really want in that. But holy, it makes possible what's not possible in the rest of the world, like a pure relationship. Right. And, and Nick and I are, have, you know, as we were dating, we really fought to honor God with every, every part of our dating relationship, not just when we're in front of our church friends, not just when we're at church, but when we're by ourselves. Right. We wanted to honor God, and, and we had really strong boundaries so we decided actually we weren't going to kiss until we got married and so and god protected that and god honored that and then and zoe and harrison did too she's fist pumping because they get it but um but even like to me the the reverence with the with the you know just that mind changes sometimes i would i would look at nick and i would, I would sometimes i would just force myself to look at his left hand before we were married and look at the lack of the ring to be like this man is not mine this is not mine. I cannot do whatever I want with him. I cannot manipulate him. I cannot make him make me feel the way I want him to make me feel. It's the emotional purity of a set apart relationship. It looks so different. The world does not do that. The world is like, if he makes you feel weird, drop him. Walk away. Right? But God's like, forgive, love, talk through it, which is only possible with a guy that's pursuing holiness. And even breakups, when you're following God, look really different than the rest of the world. When you break up in the, in the rest of the world, do you ever talk to that person again? Usually not. Unless you're, you know, gossiping about them, mad at them, right? Like, there's this, like, you break up with someone and it is done. Like, the minute you see them, you're, like, walking around the side of the street. You don't talk to him, right? And, uh, and Nick and I have had, you know, before we were dating each other, we've dated other people, too, and other people that wanted to pursue holiness. And even the way that we broke up, it was literally only possible with God, where we were like, I want to respect you. And, and I had a, you know, had a breakup with a guy, and I, and I chose, okay, God, how do you want me to think about this? I could do what the world tells me to do, which is, listen, you hurt me, this is weird, we're done. But I had a conversation with him later, and I was like, I forgive you, I respect you. I think highly of you, and I mean it. I really respect you. That is not possible in the rest of the world. Am I right? And Nick had a breakup with a girl who is actually my best friend. And that is how I know Nick. <laughs> and so, to me, let me, before you all look at how this happens, the world says, girls, do you date your friend's exes? No, it's like the unspoken rule of the world. In, in God's kingdom, where you're thinking like God, things are possible that are impossible without thinking like God. So, you know, it's way time later, and as Nick and I started kind of liking each other, I immediately, the world's like, you know, either keep the guy, drop the friend, or keep the friend, drop the guy, right? But I was like, I think it's possible to keep both with holiness. It really is. And so all three of us were so supportive of each other. This is, I know this kind of sounds crazy, but I would talk to her throughout our relationship. She was so supportive. She, to the point where while she was going to propose to me, Without telling me, he flew her down so that she could be there for my engagement, for our engagement. And so she was there, and when we went to bed,
bed that night. She slept over with me the night after Nick proposed, and we fell asleep weeping. We were like, this would not be possible. No, that's amazing. There's no way. You can't keep all the weight in the rest of the world. Does that make sense? Yeah. And so she was a bridesmaid in our wedding. You know, that's not like the rest of the world. So holiness makes possible what is impossible. And he lets you, he lets you forgive. He literally changes the way you think. And I just want to say something to the girls in here really quick. The world is not expecting you to set apart. The world is looking for you to follow your feelings, protect your feelings, guard your feelings. Don't forgive if they don't deserve forgiveness. Right? That's what the world is calling for. And God is calling you to be his. Literally like him on earth. It's the most amazing gift ever. We get to be like God wow. as we live. Yeah, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm so happy that, that, like, God, that we put God first in our relationship. Like, I can't imagine. Like, it made it so much, so much better in our marriage, so much more healthy just because we really tried to strive to be set apart and be distinct and, and, and be a, use it for a special purpose with God. You know, there's so many patterns in this world. There's so many things. You walk on a college campus, and there's so many things that uh, you see on campus that it's just kind of the way the world the world goes. And you see it at work. You know, I remember being a being a waiter at, at the illustrious Outback Steakhouse. Okay. <laughs> 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 Outback. 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 It's awesome. Works in Boston. And, uh, and my decision was, I'm going to go in, and I saw the environment, and I was like, oh, no, of, of my coworkers. And I said, okay, I'm making a decision. I'm not going to do two things. I'm not going to complain. I'm not going to gossip, because that's all anybody ever did. So I had very little to talk about most, most times with my coworkers, you know what I'm saying? But I said, I just don't want to, I don't want to become like the pattern of the rest of the world around me. And it wasn't like, I wasn't perfect with it. There was times I was like, dang, I, I mean, I messed up right there. I need to kind of get back on track, right? But it was like, I still want to conform to the rest of the patterns around me, you know? You guys have seen it. You've seen what life looks like without God. Yeah. You've seen the hurt out there that just happens over and over again, whether whether you think it's going to be different that time or not, right? You see people in your class, the people, everybody in your class is cheating. And you, you have a decision to make of like, am I really going to follow and conform to the rest of the world when they're all cheating? Yeah. Am I really going to stand and really honor God with the way I pursue my academics, you know? You might, you might see the rest of the guys that you're hanging out around, around the lunch table, talking about girls in a certain way. And you have a choice to make right there. Am I going to follow the pattern of this world, or am I going to be set apart, even if it's different, even if I'm, even if I'm considered weird by everybody else, am I going to stand up, or am I going to walk, I'm not going to get involved with some of those things, right? Maybe it's, it's in your family life, where your whole entire life you've just been yelling at your parents, you have this terrible relationship with your parents, with your siblings, you, you're, it's very toxic, you're, you're just as mad at them as they are at you, and you've heard that's just the way things are with, with teenagers and with college students and their parents. And so you can choose to kind of keep going with the pattern of the world with right. everybody else, or you can say, no, I'm going to live according to, just to honor God right. with all, with, in my family, with my friendships. Like, I'm not going to conform to all the rest of my friends are doing. I'm not going to be around people that are trying to live the way the, way the rest of the world lives. So I can tell you now, it's not going to work. And you're going to live life, and you're going to come to a point in life where you're going to feel empty. And you're going to feel like, gosh, this is not what I was created to be. Because why? Because God didn't create you to be that way. Yeah. God, from the very beginning, said you are special. I want you for a specific purpose that's going to be epic. And your life is going to be incredible. You just got to trust me and do it my way. Don't buy in to the lies around you. Yeah. But all of us, we got to make some of those decisions. You know, I, I want to be able to go around and talk about the ways that you guys uh, have decided to leave the pattern of this world and become holy. Because I know so many of you guys have done so many things. Look, just like Bree was saying, the equivalent of you throwing out uh, some clothes in your closet. I know there's so many stories we can talk about with that, where you guys have made decisions to follow God, to give up things, to radically change. First of all, I just want to say thank you. Thank you for doing that. Thank you for honoring God. Yeah, yeah. I feel like God is so proud of you. And God wants you to keep it up. And I know it's hard, but God's like, I'm so worth it. And it's right here. Just hang in there. It's going to get better. And for those of you guys that haven't done that, or are trying to figure out, like, do I really want to give up the way that I've been living to really pursue God? I just want to tell you right now, it is so worth it. Yeah. It's so worth it. And you can have hundreds, or I guess not hundreds of people, dozens, right, of stories in this room of people that their lives have been changed and they've gotten so much better because they've chosen to believe and follow and trust in God. 
and excited. Let's be holy. Not just holy in terms of religious kind of people sitting around and just trying to be like holy, you know, holy than thou kind of people. Let's be set apart. Let's be distinct. Let's be different. So when people look at you, they're like, that person's different. That person's distinct. Yes. That person, they're living for a purpose that isn't like the one I'm living. I want some of that. You know? Yeah. Let's live that out. And I think God really bless you. Guys, thanks for this mountain. Come close to us.